Okay, let's officially start. And then uh, welcome everyone. And today we are talking about the Han Dynasty and the, uh, the philosopher is Dong Zhongshu. Uh, we have a lot of people first time in this group. And then, uh, so let me go over what we are going to do now. And this is a weekly, uh, Just one minute, let me see. So everybody see the, uh, let me see. You see the present the schedule, okay. So it's a weekly project, uh, weekly meetup. So every week we talk about different subject. So last week we talk, uh, we are reading the Taoism, right? Uh, Taoism, uh, the uh, Zhuangzi, uh, the writing. So it's not much related to history. And then uh, this week, uh, that's this week is May 7th. Okay, we talk about Han Empire. Dong Zhongshu is the philosophy. And then we that's a lot of historical background about today to go over. So probably about first hour is about the uh, history. Okay, so that's why I think this one is uh, related to history. And the next week, the same time, we're going back to uh, Hinduism. Okay, so Sash, uh, Sashi or SK, is going to continue on the uh, Hinduism reading, the seer and the sin. And please look at the website I post and we I add one more paper, okay? So I read the paper. I think the paper is pretty good for you to understand why uh, you have to read this uh, uh, ancient text because it talk about the consciousness. So I will suggest if you have time and read the paper, the paper is not very long and it's very readable. So talking about the consciousness. So, and then at least for me, I read this one, then I start to understand uh, why uh, the Hinduism uh, philosophy, uh, philosopher is talking about the sin, the, the seer and the, the sin. So, and the week after, I think on May 21st, Alex is going to uh, uh, talk about the Chinese history on Qin Dynasty. Okay, that's the first empire. Uh, the reason is this, because today we deal, we has been talking about since the uh, beginning of this year, we go over all the philosophers in the warring state and uh, period of time. And then eventually we finish, I will say I finish most of them. And then today we go into the first uh, well, second empire, Han empire, but we skip one uh, dynasty, which is Qin dynasty. So uh, that's I have uh, uh, Alex, okay, uh, in May 21st, she's going to go over the Qin dynasty. And I skip that one. One of the reason is there is not much philosophy to talk about. And the basics, the philosophy, underlying philosophy is the legalism. So basics, we already covered the legalism. So the other thing would be, how does the legalism apply to the history? So create the new dynasty, the Qin dynasty. So that will be two weeks from now, Alex is going to do that. Then you can see the schedule, we were going to move on. So that's about the schedule. So it's, Anybody have any question or any concern about the schedule? Uh, you can have one minute to ask question. Otherwise, I will move on. So let's move on. For today's subject. Okay, Dong Zhongshu. Okay, basically we talk about the Han Dynasty. So uh, the philosopher we are going to talk about is Dong Zhongshu. Uh, I will ask Volunteers, anybody heard this name uh, before this meetup? Or you have an idea who is this guy? And I will, yeah, I ask for volunteer to talk about how do you know, what do you know about uh, this philosopher? Nobody heard the, uh, this name? Uh, it's a, S, uh, who is the person? Uh, C, uh, is it SK? Oh, hold on. That was CK, I believe. Oh, CK, yeah, please. Yeah. 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 Sorry, I didn't see the uh, whole screen. Yeah. Oh, yes, I have heard of the yeah. name oh, Dong Zhong Shu. Yes. Okay. He, uh, yeah. He's the yeah. one, I believe, who created uh, the union of uh, heaven and man. 
the concept of Tian Ren He Yi, I think came from him. Other than that, uh, I think he's used uh, some elements of the Taoist philosophy and fused it with Confucianism to create the basis of legitimacy for the rulers of the Han Dynasty, to rule with the mandate of heaven. I think that started from him. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. So anybody have any idea about him? So, uh, so I will assume other than CK, uh, uh, this person is totally foreign for most of the people. And I ask people uh, in Asia or in Chinese background, uh, most of the people just have a very vague uh, idea about this person. And I think he is yeah. very important. You know, uh, I believe the, Kevin also wanted to speak. Oh, Kevin, yeah, sorry. Okay, Kevin, yeah. please. Yes, yeah, thank you. Actually, CK already said something. Um, for me, this is the first guy. Uh, if you think about the uh, warring state and spring, it's about uh, uh, we call it Zhu Zi Bai Jia. It's so many uh, branch about philosophy. Here's the first uh, person legalized the uh, um, only value about uh, Confucius Zhu is come to play. So. If you back to uh, another dynasty, it's only the 50 years, the Qin dynasty we popular know. The reason being is because it's it's so cruel and also others philosophy didn't make uh, uh, a unif unification, but Lu is uh, good for unification. They call it Da Yi Tong, right? So big uh, one, unification, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Okay, so uh, let's move on. So before we do the uh, talk about this philosopher, I think we need to go through uh, the history. Okay, so first I need to introduce the Han Dynasty. How, how does the Han Dynasty created, and then and give the and then later on we are going to talk about how does the uh, the Dong Zhongshu's uh, background during that Dong Zhongshu's time. So let's go through the long history of the Chinese history and give an overview. I think I showed this picture many times. So basically you can see in this picture, okay, uh, with the Confucius, that's, that's the BC, that's zero, that's the Jesus time. Okay, so um, the war is so-called the spring and the autumn, that's Confucius and the Taoism, the Laozi's time. And then data on there's a warring state. Okay, so that's a seven states are fighting. So they take about 200 years eventually. Qin dynasty, Qin dynasty, Qin other state of Qin uh, uh, unite the entire uh, uh, China. So during the warring state, basically they have many schools, so called hundred schools, and they talk about you know everybody have their idea. The major school, one is the Taoism school. The idea would be uh, so-called Wu Wei, no action. How about the idea would be you don't do anything, the empire, empire, the emperor should not do anything. Let people do whatever they want to do. You know, people will work out itself, but turn out we know it failed. Confucius has a different idea. Confucius will assume, okay, during the, uh, it's, it, talking about the moral sense. So the talk about the sage kid. So if you keep the, the relationship, promote the morality, so the, everything will be like a family. But of course it's fair. But only thing successful is the legalism teaching, talking about reward and the punishment. So that's being exercised by Qin dynasty. So that's why, you know, after the war, and the Qin dynasty, okay, united the China, but Qin only lasted for 15 years. So after that, they have war again, they come with the Han dynasty. So that's today we are going to talk about. But Han dynasty in general, we have the two period time. So from 200 BC roughly to about the first century, okay, that's so-called the Western Han, and that's the period we are going to talk about. But Around the uh, uh, first century, they have the interrupt of the Han Dynasty, the so-called Xin, X-I-N. This Xin Dynasty only lasts for 15 years. Then they have war again. 
then the Han Dynasty restart. Okay, so that's another 200, around 200 years. Then that's the so-called the later Han. So they have the Western Han and the later Han. And after later Han, it's about 280, the so-called the Three Kingdom. Okay, so they have the three kingdoms fighting uh, each other. So uh, the last about 15 years, then they'll go to the Jin Dynasty and then go to the, uh, uh, the, the, the South and Northern Dynasty until to the 600 years. That's the uh, Tang Dynasty. China got reunited again. So you will see the story of the, take a bird's eye view of the Chinese history. <clears throat> we have a warring state from the Qin Dynasty, the China got united. And then you have a war, then they have the Western Han that got united again. Then they have the short period, short living period of uh, dynasty, Xin, Xin, Xin Dynasty. And then they have the uh, Eastern Han. So total is about 400 years. Then China got breakdown, okay? So three country, then uh, Jin is not necessarily a united country and lasts for another 400 years until Tang Dynasty, then the Ch uh, China got united again. If you look at the, on the other side of the world, you will see the Tang Dynasty. It's a peak of Chinese culture and also at the peak of the uh, Islamic culture, right? At the time is uh, Ramadan and then they started the Muhammad and uh, that's the golden age for the uh, Islamic world. And the only thing in the dark age is in the Western Europe. So if you take the, um, uh, a global view, you will see uh, the Islamic world is booming, Chinese is booming. I talk about this period of time. And then uh, Western Europe is declining. That's the time. But today we are talking about the Han Dynasty this time around the 200 BC to the first century. And that in the Western world, that's the Roman, the Roman time. Okay, so let's take a, that's the, uh, the take a great view on the uh, bird's eye view on the Chinese history. And how do we know this? Basically, Chinese like to keep everything in record. So every new dynasty, Chinese will write the history of the previous dynasty. So all the story of the warring state before Han Dynasty is recorded in the great historian. So that's from the Yellow Emperor to the early Han Dynasty. So this the, the writer is Sima Qian. Okay, we will introduce this book uh, when we got a chance. It's a so-called uh, record of great, great historian. Okay, and then uh, they have the book of Han. Okay, book of later Han. Okay, it's the blah blah blah. So according to the so-called orthodox, orthodox, uh, orthodox uh, uh, history, so until the Qing, uh, Q I N G, that's the last dynasty. So total is twenty five. So Chinese, uh, Chinese history has been always keep a good record. Is that true or not true? Is that bias or not bias? That's another uh, uh, story. But in the book, you know, everything keeps very good record on the history. That's so. That's why we know, you know, and everything we are talking about is based on this. So right now we can look at um, a different point of view. You know, if you look at um, let me see. Look at this way. If you look at, I put a period, uh, uh, a table here. So uh, we start from Sun. Okay, that's about 1500 BC uh, before Christ. That's uh, it lasts about 400 years, and that's around the Moses time. If you look at, and then go to the Zhou Dynasty, then it lasts about 275 years. And then that's about in the Greek, that's Homer's time, about 900 BC. So spring and autumn, okay, they last about 300 years. Okay, during this time in Chinese, that's a Confucius time. Okay, and then if you look at it in India, that's the Buddha, okay, is teaching during that period of time. And if you look at the after that, that's a warring state. Remember the spring and the autumn time. China have about, nobody know exactly how many states in China, but at least 200 plus state. 
and uh, they go through the war and during the warrior state uh, in China, in the same day, have about, uh, not about exactly seven uh, state. They are fighting to, uh, each other again. So this, this period of time we call warring state. So this period lasts about 250 years and they have a lot of famous uh, philosophers in uh, uh, China, Zhuangzi, okay, Mencius, uh, all the legalism is here. And that will be equivalent in Greek, that's a Socrates time. And then we go to Qin dynasty. Okay, Qin eventually unite the China, but the Qin, the philosophy Qin is, is practice is uh, legalism and the it work, reward and the punishment and unite you, uh, Qin dynasty won all the wars and the turn out to unite the entire China. It lasts only 15 years. Then they have a rebellion again. So during the Western, that's about the uh, Hannibal, you know, that's the early uh, Roman empire. Uh, Joe, then you have a question or you have something to say? Yes, I have something to say because um, because during the, okay, well, first of all, the Zhou dynasty, well, yes, the central powers did last for 275 years, but the Zhou dynasty did continue until like right until the start of the Warring States, I believe. Mm -hmm. And I believe the Warring States, you should probably include um, uh, Wei Yang, uh, um, he, since he was the, he was the legal, he, uh, he started the, um, he laid the institutions for the Qin Guo, um, like Xiao, Qin Xiao Gong. Mm -hmm. Basically, like he was the, like the. I believe you should probably put them as well as for the philosophers of warring states. That's 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 just what I want to say. That's all. Yeah. Th uh, thank you. I think you missed uh, 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 last two weeks. Uh, the. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I this first time here, so that's why. I, yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you for mentioning that. Like, yes. Depend on how do you view it. If you look at the, the Qin Dynasty. And you are right, Wei Yang or so-called Sang Yang is the most important person because he is the person reconstruct, reform the Qin state from a little ruler state become a superpower. Okay, so he is super, super important if you talk about legalism. Uh, but unfortunately, he is too busy to do in the work, so not a lot of philosophical writing. So in our legalism reading, we usually read uh, Han Feizi, uh, who is a starter. So he didn't get a real job. So it turned out that he write a lot. He wrote a lot. So we have uh, a lot of his writing so we can study. So that's, uh, I think two weeks before and we have some reading about Han Feizi. And uh, it's a surprise to me. And it turned out uh, a lot of people are very interested uh, about the Han Feizi's writing. And then uh, uh, CK, you have something to say? Uh, yes, I believe uh, Shang Yang or, or, or Gong Sun Yang or Wei Yang left behind a book called Shang Jun Shu, yeah. which is uh, also one of the important works of legalism. So he did he did write some some things, although he was very busy. <laughs> yeah, you are right. Yeah, but uh, I didn't read that one. I only read the Han Fei, and I think. Um, uh, I will appreciate, you know, uh, if somebody knows this, uh, uh, the, the writing of the Sang Yang, I can share. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah. Um, Kevin, please. Yeah, thank you, Jason. I like this chart. chart. Uh, I'll look different and go. Look at the duration about uh, each dynasty. Two thirties of one is the Qin, 15 years. Another is the Three Kingdoms. Uh, no, it's a Xin also short. Shit. This one. Yeah, uh, ha, that's uh, the first one, 15 years. All the two, like, okay, you see another one. Yes. Yeah. So all uh, three, I would say, kind of say, oh, all three. You look at the policies, very cruel, very brutal. You can think that way. That's uh, the ha about today's topic about uh, Dong Zhong Su. That's uh, why Zhu or Confucius come to play. How to soften the world, uh, lose a tension between the government and ordinary people. Another one is called the Warring States, 254 years. It's one state? No. It's about from 200, more, more than 200 states to the seven states. So that's about, you know, 
from history so this if we particularly rulers to the uh, to the people if to you know the policy is very important what philosophy is going to follow is by the way uh, Confucius they have you have historically about two thousand years now still I would say fact uh, um, East Asia society, I would say, we still have that mind in the ordinary people and ruler. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Uh, I'd like to, I probably will argue against your theory a little bit. All right. So I, I, I look at hardly people talk about the Xin Dynasty. Xin Dynasty only 15 years. Qin Dynasty is also 15 years. Uh, for over 2,000 two years, Chinese scholars like to argue Okay, Qin is using uh, legalism. That's why it's short living. But if you look at the Xin, personally, I like to look at the Xin dynasty. Okay, Xin is running by uh, the only, okay, each dynasty the founder, usually they are the in the military. But Xin, Xin dynasty, the founder is Wang Mang. He is a great Confucian scholar. So he has a a utopian idea to create a Confucian society. And then he built okay, a new dynasty, but it's only lasts for 15 years. So this one haven't been emphasized for a long time because it, in my opinion, that proof Confucius, you know, idealistic Confucian is also not working because uh, Xin Dynasty actually is trying to rebuild uh, the Confucian society, but it failed. So that's a thing we can talk later, you know, but I just like to mention, you know, he has a short, -lived, uh, short living uh, history and they have the later Han last about 200 years, the Three Kingdom and the Jin. And the Jin is difficult to argue. It's a United States because it never unite. It's only, uh, uh, always have a different uh, faction of the state coming out for the last 400 years until Tang Dynasty that become united. So today we are going to focus on the Han, okay, the Western Han. Remember the period time is around the uh, 200 BC to the first century. And if you want to refer to the Western history, the, if the philosopher was uh, Duke, uh, Lucretius, okay, the atomist during the Roman time. So uh, last time, and because I take out the map many times and I show the map. So some people told me the map is important. So I'm going to show some maps today. Okay, so this one is during the spring and the autumn. If you look at the time period of time, um, uh, I think so who speak before, uh, uh, talk about Zhou Dynasty, okay, uh, legalism. Okay, sorry, okay. So technically during the spring and the autumn, the, the head of state still Zhou, okay. Just people, just people not respect the Zhou as the leader, okay. So they are fight each other. So that they have the many state, they have over 200 states, we don't know how many, they are fighting. And supposedly, Zhou is the leader, is the emperor. If you look at the Western Europe, they have the many, many kingdoms and they still have the uh, uh, emperor, okay, uh, as the leader. But basics, you know, there's people not respect the, the, the Zhou uh, as a leader. So they still fighting. So that's the map you can see. And during this period of time, then from the uh, about the, uh, 476 to 221 BC, okay, in China, it's reduced to seven states. You can see the map, Qin Dynasty on this corner and the Qi on the east, which is the Confucius and the Manchus coming from. So that's the area during that time. You can see the map. Uh, you can imagine the, uh, the period of time, you know, if you imagine in this land, uh, before have the 200 states and the, during the war and the, you only reduce to seven states and they are still keep fighting. So until Qin Dynasty and the later on Han Dynasty, then we can see the map. You can see uh, the outline is today's map of today's China. 
and then Han Dynasty is based on this one. And you can see the Great Wall. That's the wall start to build. Today's wall, if you go to China, you see the Great Wall, which is built in the Ming Dynasty. It's in the 17th, yeah, about 16th, 17th century. But during the Warring State, and they already built the, uh, the Great Wall to prevent the, uh, the Northern people, which is before Mongolian at that time was called the Han, Han, H-U-N people. Okay, so to prevent them going to the, uh, the center, the, the land. So there's a Great Wall and then Han Dynasty is the territory is around this one, and then you can see this map according here, so-called Min Yue. Okay, this one is today's uh, Fujian, Hong Kong. Okay, uh, this kind of area, but you know it's not been included. That's in the uh, they 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 they've been united later in the later time. So you can see during the Han Dynasty, so-called united, the size is about uh, about one third of today's China. So that's the first time that's about the Han Dynasty. You know, how does the Han, Han create it? It's, if you look at on the, if you try to imagine how does it work out, it will be similar to the uh, Roman Empire, right? So it started and, and become a so-called United States. So before we go to a little bit detail during the Dong Zhong Su's time, and I would like to open a few questions or if you want to, uh, share your idea or anything about the uh, history to this period of time. You know, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Will, please. The Will, please. Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, please. Um, this is sort of um, a really big question, but um, what from dynasty to dynasty, like. Um, like I, when I think about Europe and, and like um, the the Greek the Persian Empire the Greek Empire the Roman Empire it seemed like there's a, a this is a complete change of culture and and uh, in China is uh, is it just the rule rulership that changes or is is the culture kind of continuous um, and and um, is there like continuity. Uh, I, I mean, like Confucianism seems to last throughout all the dynasties. Um, so so um, how much continuity is there from dynasty to dynasty? Okay, uh, thank you, Will. Uh, yeah, you are right. It's a very big question. And to answer simply, I will say that's different than Europe. Okay, we can say, okay, it's continued in the same culture, okay. but with some exception. And we will go through the exception later on. So not today, but you know, going on, you will start to tell the subtle difference. But to answer your question quickly, it's all continue. And they, of course, they have the interruption. For example, like uh, Mongolian, the Ch uh, Chinese Khan, okay? The Mongolian invasion, okay? Basics, the culture totally changed, right? So through the time, 2000 years, of course they have changed, but we can say the Confucian as an orthodoxy, okay? It's always like this. And today, why today Dong Zhong Su is important? Because Dong Zhong Su set up as the Confucian Orthodox, okay, for 2000 years, over 2000 years. So that's why it's important. Yeah. Thank you, Will, to ask this big question. Thank uh, you. CK and, uh, Dan, uh, and uh, Daniel, CK, please. Yes, I'd like to make uh, three points. Uh, firstly, I think for the warring states, it started with many states. And then it gradually dwindled down to not actually eight, seven states. I think there were at least one more state, which is a very small state called the state of Wei, eight states, which was the last state to be eliminated by the Qin, uh, the state of Qin. Yeah. So technically there were at least it was the end, eight states in existence, um, including Wei. Mm -hmm. uh, also the map of Han China, I find the map a little small. What happened to the Western region, CU? Because- Oh, I that's in I... the later time. That's in the later time. I think I should put a look at this one. This is about 100 BC, if you look this. Okay. Okay. I see, I see. Yeah. All right. Later okay. on, it expanded, especially to the Eastern Han, they expanded to this area, right? Yes. Okay, because uh, then I want one last thing. 
you mentioned the Huns, H-U-N-S. I think they should be referred to as the Xiongnu instead. Yeah. Because we are not completely certain that they are they are the Huns, although there are some arguments saying that the Huns, which, which appeared in Europe, is the same as the Xiongnu. But uh, we, we don't really, we are not completely certain yet. So we should refer to what the, the, the northern threat in during Han and Qin China as the Xiongnu instead, to be specific, I think. Yeah, thank you, CK. Yeah, I also include as a Xiongnu, but um, at the while, I kind of not want to use this name. One of the reason is this name is discriminative, okay? <laughs> because the Chinese always use uh, some uh, name to call the foreigner. So that's why I kind of like to call it Hans. But unfortunately, the Hans and the Hans is sound similar. So it's also confusing. confusing. So I probably I should call both as a Xiongnu or the Hans. But basically, I refer to the people around here. And we don't know what's their originality. And basically, we assume they are the ancestor of uh, Mongolian. But uh, we don't know, just like CK said, we are not very sure. You know, they probably originated, or originated from uh, Europe or, you know, or from uh, Asia. We, we really don't know. Uh, Daniel, please. Yeah, I, I don't know. I think I basically the same issue that uh, Will was mentioning. You know, I get a sense that uh, that the Chinese philosophy from dynasty dynasty is more politically oriented. Mm -hmm. And whereas let's say in uh, Europe, Western, you know, you had religious differences and not so much as philosophy of, you know, how to, what's the right life to live? What's the way to live, find meaning, all those things. And similarly in Hinduism, uh, you had religious cultures, but not philosophical differences. Here, it seems that pol politics and philosophy are interacting in a different way than they are in other parts of the world. Is that correct? And can you give us an overview of those issues, please? Yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, yeah, you, I think I would say you are correct, okay? But the correct start from this time. Before uh, Han Dynasty, you can see that the many school, and if you ask the uh, uh, philosopher like Confucius, what's your job? He's a teacher. Mencius, what's your job? I don't know. <laughs> He's just a teacher. Okay. Zhuangzi, the famous philosopher we talked about last week, does he has a job? Yes, he probably like Pin said. Probably he is a gardener for the royal garden. Okay. So not an important position. Uh, Han Fei, he got a job, okay, but he is a starter, so he didn't do much things. He writing. Xunzi, Xunzi is a scholar, okay, and then why we can but he has no official job. So you see, before Han or before China got united, then the philosopher they talk about different things, but they have no job. But you will see, that's why today, I think today's uh, section, uh, Dong Zhong Su is very important and the most of people probably understand, underestimate his importance because he is going to set up the development for the next 2000 years, not only Confucius uh, teaching us, also Duxi. Another important thing is they mix the political and the philosopher together. So from now on, every philosopher we talk about you can ask his job title. He always a prime minister or the minister in the central government. So they all put it together. So you are exactly right. When you talk about philosopher, okay, philosophy after this time, you always related to politics, except, except the neo Taoism. Okay, that's uh, we will talk about later. But from now on, or just like if you look at in the Western Europe, uh, during the uh, so-called the Middle Age, right? Every philosopher, okay, is related to church, or they are heresy, okay. So you talk about Thomas Aquinas, talk about Saint Augustine, okay? they all related to church, 
Okay, so I think that would be the similar situation where you deal with one nation and they require one thought. So that, that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, Jordan, please. Yes, um, I guess one thing I wanted to point it out, because uh, you said um, before, um, was you said besides Wang Mang, every, every, um, every person that succeed, every successor of a dynasty was, uh, was basically a Wu Jiang or military general. It's, it's a bit of a false because uh, the Wu Jiang or military generals are actually during after the Jin dynasty or like Nanbei Tao, the Northern and Southern dynasties. Every, all of these rulers are legitimate rulers in the sense that they have received a feudal a feudal title from 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 the from the central government and uh and i find it pretty ironic that with Wang Wang Mang because he is actually related to the emperor of the of the, the last the last west western han dynasty emperor because he is a because he's a relative of the of the emperor and he basically Tuan Wei basically dethroned the emperor mm -hmm. and it's a bit against the uh the confusion belief that that uh regardless of how regardless of how Wu Dao or how this is my understanding actually like like how mm -hmm. how like how like how moralist the emperor or incompetent the emperor is like you really shouldn't like uh fan shang you shouldn't like revolt against the uh, against your superior against the superior power which i find it to be quite ironic and then he basically got got dethroned again by got revolted by the uh, by got revolted by the by the restorers of the of the Han of the Han Dynasty, which is I find it pretty funny, even though his even though he, he wants he, he had a nice vision, but it just didn't work out. Yeah, I think he's a ironical, a very a very interesting person to study. And personally, I I I spend a lot of time to understand him because he is actually he is a scholar. Okay, he unlike most of. Uh, uh, the dynasty founder, you know, he is a scholar. He has a lot of writing and he truly believes Confucian's uh, teaching. But does he do it in his Confucian way? That's another question. You know, just like you said, he is a relative of uh, uh, Han Emperor actually from the uh, marriage, right? His in-laws, his uh, uh, brother-in-law of the emperor. So, you know, blah, 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 blah. So, but turn out he take over and he used the Dong Zhong Su's idea, put the yin yang and the, the naturalism and say that's the mandate of heaven and he should continue for the Han Dynasty and continue with all this kind of uh, nature, naturalism uh, teaching uh, to uh, uh, philosophizing the history development. Yeah. Uh, oh, by the way, I also want to say one thing about Will's um statement. Like, yes, I would feel like the Chinese, like the Chinese people are, or basically the Chinese civilization is, has been throughout, um, been consistently like their beliefs and beliefs has been somewhat consistent. Like the the political institutions have been have regardless regardless of dynasty have been like been consistent. Like 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 the the position of Xiang Guo Zai Xiang, our Chancellor Prime Minister, has been. Like you just have a different name, but the idea is the same. And like you still have like the emperors, like regardless if they're barbarian or basically non-Chinese or not, they still they still have like they will still have like you know like a, like calendar names and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I would say regardless of like whoever comes into play, like like overall the Chinese civilization, like in terms of political thought, but also a bit as well as cultural thought, has been somewhat consistent as well. Of course, there is imp importation and diffusion as and sanitization of, of foreign ideas, of course. Yeah, thank you. And especially I appreciate you talk about Xiang Guo or Zai Xiang. And usually we translate as a prime minister. But if you look at, uh, I assume you know Chinese. Okay. Oh, I'm Chinese. I'm Chinese American. No, actually. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so Xiang Guo or Zai Xiang, right? If you look at these two words, Zai and Xiang, both or Chen Xiang, right? Yeah. Basically, basically, it means assistant, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Assistant. So basically, he is assistant. The, uh, the emperor, okay. So here, uh, I think uh, later on in a few slides, I'm glad that you mentioned this because I, I also thought about exactly the same question because during the Dong Zhong Su's time, the prime minister or Chen Xiang, this kind of position has been redefined. And then you will see uh, uh, this position used, usually before Han was taken by the uh, relative of the emperor. Okay, but after Dong Zhongshu, they start to use the regular people or scholar 
for the uh, this kind of position. So I think that's also an important de development during this time. So I think the uh, uh, today's session is not only important in the philosophical development uh, for the Chinese history, also politically also important during the uh, for the next two hundred years. So, so right now I'm going to move on to the second part uh, about Dong Zhongshu. And I'm not going to talk too much about the person, but I would like to talk about more on the, his background during this time, okay? So right now we already done with the great Chinese history from the beginning to the warring state, to the Qin dynasty, to the Han dynasty. If you have a question about Qin dynasty and in two weeks you can join us and we will talk about warring state from warring state to the Qin dynasty. So from now on, we talk about Han dynasty. In the Han dynasty, before Dong Zhongshu's time, okay, then we go through different emperor to emperor. We will see from different emperor. So I list the um, emperor's name and uh, how long he ran and all the important situation. Okay. So first one is so-called, okay, uh, before I talk about name, I think I need to explain something so-called uh, uh, posthumous name or title. Okay. In Chinese history, okay, if you name the emperor, they have a given name. Okay, so you see Liu. Liu is the last name of the Han Dynasty. So they all their last name is Liu. Okay, so we have Liu Bang, Liu Heng, Liu Qi, Liu Che, Liu Fu Ling. Okay, so that's the uh, emperor's name. But in the history, people don't call their name. They call their posthumous name or title. So the founder usually called Gaozu. So when you look at, read the history book, it's usually confusing for a lot of people. Uh, so you will call Han Gaozu, okay? Han is the dynasty name, okay? And the Gaozu will be his posthumous name. And the posthumous name, it's Chinese tradition, also called the Ru tradition. Usually, you don't get this name until you die, and your successor will give you a name. So this name will usually is one word, sometimes two words, most of the time just one word. This one character is going to define your life. So the idea is this, you will work, okay, uh, to avoid the bad name, and you want to keep a good name. And it's also very critical for the successor to name their predecessor or usually their father, give a name, okay? So in a way you have to be respectful and in a way you should be truthful, okay, what you do. So usually the good name is Wen, means culture, if you achieve a lot of culture, culturally achievement or Wu, that means military achievement, okay? Something like I, Dao, Sui, that means you are doing bad job, okay? So, there's, so that's the posthumous name to it. But personally, I like to call the full name, that would be easier, okay? That's kind of, but unfortunately in the Chinese history, all written in the uh, posthumous name. And if you look at the, uh, translation in the uh, English book about Chinese history, they usually translate from the Chinese document, which is posthumous name. So you will see a lot of, some people will ask, how come the emperor always name only a few names, they're always the same, but you know, that's the posthumous name. So I just want to make it uh, simple for uh, the time, uh, the early Han, Dynasty. A few beginning with Han Gaozu is Liu Bang. And remember, Liu Bang is not uh, from the aristocratic background. He's just a local office, uh, uh, official, okay? The regular, uh, the position probably like a male, probably a small county's male, this kind of position. And he rebelled and eventually built the, uh, the Han Dynasty. So people call him Gaozu, and he only ran for seven years. After he died, okay, uh, they have the, his son and they have the many emperor, I just skip. But basically his wife, okay, I put the red here is Du, okay, and that, I just make sure 
I didn't misspell. Uh, Liu is his wife's last name. Liu is his name. So his wife, Lu Zi, okay, controlled the uh, government so for 15 years. And after she died, and then we have the Emperor uh, Liu Heng, okay, and the so-called uh, Wen Di, okay, you can see the name Wen, that means he achieved a lot in culture, and then his son Liu Qi, Jing Di, okay, so these two total will be about 40 years, that's China, uh, Han Dynasty, the booming time, because this time, because you, you can imagine, for the uh, uh, warring state to the Qin Dynasty, to the Han Dynasty, this continuous war, Okay, the, and then so eventually we have 40 years, people start to rest. And the political being practiced here, here is Taoism. Okay, so basics this time, the government philosophy is Taoism. Basically, you try not to bother people too much, stay away, let people do what they want to do. So basically doing nothing. And then there's one interruption is during the uh, so-called the Jing Di, okay, Liu Qi, the time they have the short period of the civil war. Uh, I think they finished uh, the rebel take up seven st uh, small state try to rebel and then eventually it got uh, suppressed and it take, uh, take only three months to, to finish. So after that, China become a centralized government. It's really a centralized government. So then come with Wu Di, Wu Di, you can see the name, the posthumous name, Wu, means he achieved a lot military. Okay, so Liu Che, he been in position for 54 years. So he achieved a lot. So then they have, blah, 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 they have more. So today we do from the Chinese history, we down to the Han Dynasty. And from the Han Dynasty, we have many emperor. So right now we're going to focus Wu Di's period of time, which is Dong Zhongshu's time. And you will see uh, during this emperor and this philosopher, okay, what's going on in, what's happened in uh, Chinese history. So give a quick uh, introduction of this uh, emperor, uh, Wu Di or Liu Che. Okay. And if I do uh, some search, I think in Chinese history and especially for most uh, nationalist government uh, will appraise Wu Di a lot because he uh, achieve a lot. And if you search from the Chinese soap opera, and then that's, I think how many is a lot uh, soap opera talking about uh, Wu Di because he being considered of, uh, one of the greatest emperor. And uh, the people, uh, Chinese people, uh, be Han people because of this name and because uh, uh, Wu Di, okay. So uh, Kevin, you hands, hands up, uh, please. Yeah, last slide, please. I'm going to two points over there. Okay, please. Yeah. The first, uh, the second line you see is how the view just asked question about the Chinese dynasty. That's one example, one dynasty. Uh, mm -hmm. You see best family name, Liu. Yeah. Uh, and you see, however, you see the child second one. After Gozu, that's his wife. That's a surprise Western O. That's uh, if a basic confused as Fu, uh, right, the Sang Guan Wu Chang, like the traditional ritual, a uh, lady should not in empire. That's one example. Next dynasty, Tang also got Wu Zhe Tian. I try to use English, could I uh, use Chinese? I cannot remember English translation. Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, I'm going to pause here just for our knowledge. By the way, I send some chat sometimes for for some terms on wiki. For example, Xiong Nu was uh, uh, Jason Manchin and Wang Ma, that's uh, how he, he, he that, that person. Why not valuing the China? Because uh, it's not a follow tradition, right? It's uh, basically from the, uh, your for, foreign and not direct from uh, Liu, then you, you, you see the last name is Wang, you conquer the, you know, Wang, so that's not a, tradition Chinese uh, uh, books, philosophy not a value that. Uh, thank you, Jason, point about this is important. I do a quick research for that, <laughs> it is a great, it's, it's an important person for, for long yeah, term, um, thank you. Yeah, there's uh, three important women, okay, political, uh, if you want to know Chinese uh, history, three important women you need to remember. 
First is Lu Zi, he's uh, 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 in the Han Dynasty. In the Tang Dynasty, so called Wu Zhe Tian. Okay, that's well, if you want to equip them, that's the uh, Russians, uh, the Catherine the Great. Okay, so that's Wu Zhe Tian. And the last one is in the Qin Dynasty, that's in the 19th, 19th century. Okay, so the Empress Cixi. Okay, so these three women is the powerful woman in the Chinese history, the most powerful woman, uh, Lu Zi. Wu Zetian and Cixi, that's the three women. And then uh, if we have a chance, we can talk about this. It's an interesting story. Okay, so let's talk about what Wu Di achieved. Okay, it's many things, but I just quickly, uh, some, okay, because he has been in Ren for uh, 54 years. And our main character, Dong Zhongshu, was born before his time. Okay, but he got a, a, a job during the Han Wu Di, okay, the Liu Cheng's time. So when the year 138 BC, he conquered the Mingyue, which is Fujian and the Southern China. Remember the map on the east side? Okay, it happened. Okay. Then uh, three years later, he conquered the so-called Nanyue, that's Hong Kong, Macau, Vietnam. Okay, remember during that time, Vietnam was conquered and belonged to China. And then uh, one year later, Dong Zhongshu, okay, he proposed about the Confucian Orthodoxy. Okay, that's an important uh, document. And one day we should, uh, if I got a chance, I probably can uh, find the translation, uh, work on the translation, and we can read this uh, document to see how he, historical document. And then, uh, then later on next year, uh, he spent a lot of year and a lot of money, and then it's a Han and the Xiongnu's war, okay? And I call it the Xiongnu or called Han's people, just like, you know, uh, it's, okay. So then uh, in the uh, 108 BC, he invasion of the Korean Peninsula, uh, not successful, but he tried to conquer Korea. So you can see how aggressive Han Wu Di is doing and uh, why he got appreciated for the any uh, Chinese uh, nationalism government. And one thing I'd like to mention in the 99 BCE, okay, castration of Sima Qian, okay. Sima Qian got castrated, okay, because he, Han Wu Di is angry about him because he's, he tried to rescue Li, Liu, Li Ding, it's a general who surrendered to uh, uh, Xiongnu or Hans, okay, and uh, the Han Wu Di got angry, so uh, he has a choice, okay, uh, got killed or castrated. So Sima Qian decided to be, take this kind of uh, humility, hum, hum, humility uh, 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 punishment, got castrated because he has job not done yet. He went to write, finish his book, The History. So that's a very uh, important e event. That's why I put it here. Okay, so uh, that's what Han Wu Di is doing during this time. Okay, so uh, a lot of thing, another thing I'd like to talk about a little bit, it's not in the uh, reading, uh, the Feng Yolan's reading, and I, uh, I summarize this one from the, uh, I don't know how many know this book, uh, Qian Mu, uh, Synopsis of Chinese History. He is, this book is written in 1933 during the Sino-China, uh, China, Japanese war, uh, during the World War II, okay. So um, I think here's a good summary, talk about Wu Di, about the political reform, okay. And if you look at this one and start to think about, you will see uh, that's important to change the Chinese 2000 years history, okay. First, he set up the court, uh, Academic, academic, the scholar, the doctor, so-called. Uh, and this one is only focused on the Confucian for five classics, okay? So they have the five classic book, okay? And then that means the scholars from other school, when you study other school, you are excluded from the government employment. So that's important. They set up the 70 court scholars and their job, they don't have a real, really government administrative job, but they kind of doing as a consultant suggestion, this kind of position, okay, like a think tank, but they all Confucius, okay, all Confucian scholars, that's number one. Second, they assign the disciples, okay, for the court scholar, the, the kind of like a think tank, and they have been trained for civil service, 
So that means the Confucian scholar, disciple, student, not the aristocrats, have been trained for the government official or doing the civil service. That's another change. Okay? That change is long lasting. Okay? And the number three, the, gov the governor and the, the local governor and the mayor are appointed by the central government. Before it's a feudalism, right? Because you have the son and you assign son to certain area and your grandson become you know, a success. As an, so that's the feudalism system, but it's totally changed during this time, in Wudi's time, after the civil war. The governor and the mayor are appointed by the central government. And the number four, the government employed are forbidden to run business. I think that's important because since that time, if you look at the rich people in China, they all related to government. They are government employee. There's no rich businessman in general speaking. Okay? There's no rich businessman because uh, during that time, they start to ban doing business if you are taking government job. And uh, number five, that's just, uh, I, uh, you talk about, I think it's, um, it's a CK, or I'm talking about the prime minister. Okay. Before the prime minister usually is the noble or emperor, em, em, uh, emperor's relative or the generals. Okay, but from this time, the prime minister being assigned by the uh, 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 emperor, and the emperor can change. So that means you know uh, anybody got a chance, any scholar got a chance to be the prime minister. So this five political reform is long lasting and that's impact for the rest of the uh, time of the Chinese history. So that's the background of the uh, Han Wu Di. And then uh, before I go that, let me, uh, let me open some question. If any question before I go to Dong Zhong Su, the person, I think we are doing well on the time. We spent just exactly one hour on the historical background. And before I go to the uh, philosophy. So uh, any question or any comment want to talk about around this time? So CK, please. Yes, I have a comment on the military uh, conquest of uh, Han Wu Di. Okay. He <laughs> conquered what you call Nan Yue, what we call Nan Yue. Yeah, but Nan Yue didn't include the whole of Vietnam. I think we have oh, to be precise yeah. here. It's the northern part of Vietnam. It's yeah. called Tonkin, the Gulf of Tonkin area. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the southern part of uh, Vietnam and and the central part was not part was not a part of the Han Dynasty. Um, so that's I think that we we should be clear there. I mean, it is only the northern part of uh, of, of Vietnam that's involved. And what they call later on Chiao Zhi, I think that's the area. Thank you. Any other comment or any, uh, I'm not, yeah, of course, you know, I, a lot of language I use are not very uh, clear or very correct. I just roughly mentioned uh, Vietnam, okay, but uh, CK exactly right, okay. Uh, it's only on the northern part, not on the southern part. Uh, the, uh, Kevin, please. Yeah, you see, you put here as political system related, right? <laughs> you compare to these days, uh, it's I feel Chinese have history about this. It used to be it's one family dominated. Basically, they should start formulate. Okay, I'm the king, but the prime minister would be, you know, based on the, not just I don't call my relative or my son. I'm going to use the who can ever manage it. They have this tradition from the last of the, the fifth you see that, right? Mm -hmm. And also number four, even now still, it's an interesting conflict. So number four, if you are a governor officer, normally you try just, you know, um, at least your own, don't, you know, do business related or self promo to yourself, you get yourself benefit. Uh, especially directly relatives. That's also apply. And the, the number three, also, yeah, central government is still powerful. They point to the, uh, each province, uh, 
the um yeah the leader and uh, what's the second yeah it's a very very interesting it's still all seems uh, still work now but however we gonna going to see okay that's uh, from you know uh, communist party or something i would say have history over here yes thank you all right thank you so uh let's we about the history before we go to the uh, the person dong zhong su okay so you will start to know you know the person the philosophy coming from this background and uh, then uh, I like to pay attention. I copy from the, not from the Feng Yolan's book. Okay, I copy from another book, uh, Dr. Grant Hardy. And he has a book called The Great Minds of the Eastern Intellectual Tradition. And his summary about Dong Zhongshu is very good. And I like to read this one. And I like to you pay attention on that. And I think that's very important. And he called Dong Zhongshu as uh, eclecticism. Okay, which means combine everything together. Okay, so that's his writing. The fifth Han Emperor Wu Di, okay, that's Liu Che, okay, enact educational reform that returned Confucian thought to the fore on the advice of Dong Zhongshu, a minister, philosopher, and one of Sima Qian's teacher. Dong's idea stress synthesis and unity. He argued that heaven, earth, and the humankind were intimately connected and proposed a macrocosmic and microcosmic model of the universe. The human body is a model of the cosmos supported by numerology. Okay, so that's important because he start to include the yin yang school. Okay, the, try to give the Confucius uh, uh, a philosophy, a metaphysic background, metaphysic uh, foundation for that. He continued, Dong's argument may seem silly from a modern scientific perspective, but his point was that morality is based in the natural world. Re remember, he tried to develop, find the moral background, okay? He considered it's from nature. Heaven provided a model for human action and the Confucian human relationship. Emperor rule minister, father rule sons, husbands rule wife. Sorry for the, <laughs> the uh, his philosophy offered a, re a rationale for strong centralized rule and the synthesized Taoism, legalism, the naturalism, which is Yin Yang school and the Confucianism. So, we have a so-called hundred schools, okay, before Han Dynasty in the warring state. And then during this time, look guys, on the surface, you see it's only Confucian, Confucianism. But if you look at, if you look at on the previous slide, the government structure, okay, uh, it's this one, all this structure, especially like number three, okay, the government will appoint by the central government. This one definitely is legalism thinking. This one totally is not Confucian thinking. Confucian thinking is we have a family, father and the son. Okay, the son respect father, father loves son. And this relationship is going to grow in the state, in the entire world. So it's nothing wrong have your son become a governor. And after you die, the governor die and the governor's son succeed the position. It's nothing wrong with that in the Confucius idea. That's perfect the feudalist system. But the legalism system totally take away on this, put all the power in the emperor. Okay, so the totally uh, the, uh, absolute centralized government. So this kind of legalism thinking has been included in the uh, in the Dong uh, Zhong Su thinking. So you will see not only Taoism thinking, which is harmonic, okay, between uh, uh, heaven, earth, and the humankind, that's the Taoism thinking, and the legalism thinking, and the naturalism thinking are all included in Dong Zhong Su's Confucian thinking. So from now on, when you look at the Confucianism, it's not the original Confucius teaching. It's become a different kind of Confucius teaching. So I think that's why, you know, 
it's important in the Dong Zhong Su, right, this idea. So any question, any comment on this one before I move to the uh, little bit detail? And from now on, I'm going to cover the, uh, the book from uh, Feng Youlan is writing about detail about uh, I, Dong Su. I got a quick comment about this page. Oh, please, yeah. Uh, on the, this uh, empire rules minister, that is rule. I will change that word to follow. Uh, not, not, you know, you know, it's like a minister of all empire. That would be uh, more, it's, it's not a, sometimes rule, right? Father rules, son, how do you do that, right? So it's, a, yeah, it's just a word thing, a feeling different. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think the later on when we read, uh, Dong Zhong Su have a more detailed uh, writing about uh, this kind of a relation, so-called three major relationship. Okay, so follow, following, we are going to talk about the Yin Yang school and the Ru, the Confucianism uh, tradition, how do they put together? Okay, so and then the, a uh, theory of the human nature, social ethic. Okay, so all this kind of thing. So, so first, let's talk about Yin Yang and the Confucian. And this one is from Feng Youlan's writing. Okay, according to Dong Zhong Su, See, okay, remember, we call it Dong Zhong Su, okay? If you are in the uh, start from the beginning of this year, all the philosophers we call is something like Xuan Zi, Nancius, Confucius, and something Zi, 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 okay, that's missed. But for now, okay, so the people are not being called as Zi, okay, we, so we call the full name, okay, or job title. So uh, that's the difference. According to Dong Zhong Su, since man is a part of heaven, the justification of the behavior of man must be found in the behavior of heaven. He thought with the yin yang school that a close interconnection exists between heaven and the man. Starting with this premise, he combined a metaphysical justification which derived chiefly from the yin yang school, which or sometimes we call it the nature, uh, naturalism, uh, with a political and the social philosophy, which chiefly Confucianist. That's Feng Youlan's, uh, Feng Youlan's argument about the Dong Zhong Su's uh, Confucian um, uh, philosophy. is using yin yang school as his background. So that comes with the interest subject. And we've been talking about many times, and even in different meta, uh, meetup, when we talk about uh, Dao De Jing, we talk about Tian, okay, uh, the heaven, that's the translation I use, and the most of uh, uh, English uh, book use heaven, okay. So uh, according to Feng Youlan, okay, he has a, a long paragraph talking about Tian, and later I'm also going to introduce a different idea. Okay, Tian is in general translated as heaven, they have the concept of divinity and the nature. So basics, according to Feng Youlan, it's uh, both divinity and the nature, and the divinity preside over the nature. But sometimes, and I think this sentence is interesting. When you read, it's emphasized sometimes on divinity, sometimes on nature. I think this statement is very true. When you read the original Chinese text, when Chinese use Tian, Sometimes it's emphasized on the divinity, sometimes on nature, but sometimes both. But that's the interesting part. And I'd like to share with this writing from Hegel, the philosophy of history. And Hegel writes the philosophy of history. Of course, his main idea is talking about spirit. And according to him, spirit is also uh, reason. So, that's his writing, okay. I'm not saying Hegel is always right. He has a lot of bias and his purpose of right, talking about Chinese philosophy is to try to talk about his idea of spirit, the, the, the nation, uh, the cultural development. So a lot of things are not so correct, but his uh, writing about heaven, Tian is interesting. Uh, so let's look at how Hegel talk about the uh, uh, concept of Tian. This heaven might be taken in the sense of our term, God, 
as the Lord of nature. For example, we say heaven protect us. But such a relation is beyond the scope of Chinese thought. For here, the one isolated self-consciousness is a substantial being. <coughs> the emperor himself, the supreme power. Heaven has therefore no higher meaning than nature. That's he uh, thinking about heaven. But the next sentence, he talked about uh, the, uh, the bishop has been sent to China and they deal with Tian and the bishop, instead of calling it the heaven, the term Lord of Heaven should be adopted. So he think Tian should be con uh, considered as the Lord of Heaven. The, re the relation of Tian is supposed to be such that the good conduct of individual and of the emperor brings blessing. Their transgressions, on the other hand, cause want and evil of all kinds. The Chinese religion involves the primitive element of magical influence over nature. If the emperor behaves well, prosperity cannot but ensue. Heaven must attend prosperity. So I think Hegel's description is very correct to talk about the concept of Tian because that's the relation. If you behave well, the, hem the emperor behavior then heaven is going to reward with prosperity. In another way, if you have a disaster, they must have something wrong, either on the human or on the emperor. So that's the concept of Tian and the idea has been developed during this, this time. Man, both in his physiological and mental aspect is a replica or duplicate of heaven. As such, he is far superior to all other things of the world. Man, heaven, and earth are the, ori uh, are the origins of all things. Heaven gives them birth, earth gives them new, uh, nour nourishment, and the man gives them perfection. How does man accomplish this perfection? It is done through Li, which is ritual, and the Yue, which is music or we can uh, try, uh, consider them as civilization and the culture. Heaven, earth, and the man are related to each other like the hands and the feet. United, they give the finished physical form so that no one of them may be dispensed. So that's the uh, Dong Zhong Su's concept about the heaven, earth, man, okay, the triad, the, their relationship. So that's, um, I, will, I should not call his invention, but that's the important being adopted in the Confucius uh, teaching. At least in Confucius, it's not doesn't have strong thinking about this one. So you can see the relation of the Yin-Yang school has been used and the Taoism is being used in Dong Zhong Su's uh, philosophy. So next one, we're going to talk about human nature, okay? So uh, in, in my point of view, I think the Chinese philosophy like to talk about human nature, unlike uh, Western philosophy, okay? I, 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 I like to call human nature, okay? The answer will be, the debate will be either human nature is good or bad, okay? That's a so-called perennial philosophical question in Chinese philosophy, right? Because through the years, people argue human nature is good or bad. And this one doesn't exist in the Western philosophy that often in the Western world, people tend to argue whether or not people have a free will or not. Okay. So that's the, uh, I would say that's the uh, key difference between the, uh, uh, the, the Chinese philosophers concern and the Western concern. So we have a few hands up and let's have uh, Madeline and uh, Jordan. Madeline, please. Yes, uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, I think it's very interesting. I believe this is the first time uh, in our readings so far that human beings have been the most important uh, living creatures in the world. And as I recall uh, in Western history, that was the Stoics. And uh, so I think this is a major development in Chinese philosophy, uh, the human beings that heaven is dependent upon our actions 
and especially the actions of the emperor, um, it probably, I don't know that the, the, this, uh, I mean, I'm, I know it was always anthropocentric because we're human beings, we're anthropocentric, but uh, still it seems to have it explicitly stated like this is new in the philosophy. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, please. Yeah, actually, I'd like to note something that, um, well, because well, well, um, because with Chinese, with Chinese religion or Chinese folk religion, it's pretty diverse. Like the Southerners and Northerners will have their own blend, and then Chinese theology has a really, really long thought. Like if you look at the Jia Gu Wen, basically the oracle from the Shang Dynasty, like their concept of God is more akin to the. Uh, more akin to the Abrahamic religions in sense, in the sense that there is a more like a supreme deity, like that's that's anthro, that's that's anthro, as anthropomorphic. But then, like, but now you trans, but then, like, through history, like, when like, since well, the the Shang called their god Di or Hao Tian, Hao Tian Shang Di, or basically or Lao Tian, mm -hmm. yeah, basically, like, so basically, and uh, and Di is basically like a, like a ruler emperor, which is very uh, which is like 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 human characteristics. But then, when you have the when the when the Zhou Dynasty showed up and or basically took over, uh, they used they used Tian instead. And then Tian has a very like has a very um, has a very like non -anthrop non anthropomorphic sense. It's like it's very like it's like it's more like it's like it's like like a principle. It's like laws. It's like it's like it, there's there isn't much like there isn't like much like of a human characteristic to it, which is, which, uh, which is, which I find is something really interesting. Like if like, if the, if the Chinese religion like became like, like decided to take a route that was very similar to like the thinking that was, was very similar to the Western religions, I would want to see like, like if like when, when the, when the Catholic bishops came to China during the Qing dynasty, how much of a, how much of a less misunderstanding uh, of the translations would they have compared to now? Yeah, thank you, Jordan. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Yeah, yeah, uh, yes. The concept of Tian, I think we have been discussed for many times. So, so uh, and then uh, uh, it's a difficult concept. Yeah. Uh, CK, please. Yes, I just want to make a comment. This con uh, concept of the triad, Tian Di Ren, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. It's putting the human being at the center of, you know, is the perfection of, uh, you know, of the three, because then the, the, the Tian gave birth, the Di gave it, gave him or her nourishment. And then he, or well, mostly it's a he, can gain, can gain perfection or perfectibility. Um, this concept is not entirely the same, but it's quite similar during the Renaissance where, where man is placed back as the center of the cosmos mm -hmm. by the Renaissance uh, thinkers, um, by the rediscovery of the Greek uh, philosophies. So that's, uh, uh, you know, that's they developed from different um, strands, but it, it, essentially there are some similarities between both, um, both uh, eras, I think, although there are, there are they are um, at least a thousand five hundred years apart. I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a similarity here. That's a thousand years apart, and well, more than thousand years apart. And if you compare in the Roman world during this time, uh, two hundred BC, I don't know the Stoic, and then just like beginning to develop. So, uh, I just have to say during this time, probably. Uh, in the Chinese philosophy, uh, the culture of much, much more advanced compared to the Western world. Um, oh, Lily, please. Sorry, I muted myself. So I think um, because of the, in the Tian, like uh, somebody said uh, yeah, previously, because uh, um, the people, they, we live on, and, and they are in the, we are in the middle. So the older Ren, like uh, in the middle, and the, the the Tians are above the Ren, right? So mm -hmm. and the and the all the saints, like uh, they are on the on the heaven, in the, in the heaven. So that's above the the people on the we are on, on, on the earth. So so um and the and the Tianzi, that's the emperor, 
it's this we think that the sum of uh, the um center the highest uh, um controller on the heaven that's the sun that he's the son of the um, the 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 highest controller on on, on the have in the heaven so that's why um we we, we call emperor we call emperors are uh tianzhi like a like a heaven's sun or something like that is yeah. that correct oh, yeah. yeah thank you uh Okay, so let's move on about another thing uh, the Chinese philosopher like to talk about is uh, the human nature. And in Confucius and the, the Dong Zhong Su, they talk about two things, xing and the qing. Okay, so here you talk about xing just like a young part of the human nature. Okay, he's called the human nature. Okay, so it comes to the virtue of a human ren, okay, so called the heartedness or benevolence. And the xing is your emotion, your feeling. It's more on the inside. Okay, it's not all bad, but you need to control it. Otherwise, you will have a vice on that. So need to be controlled by the okay. So so the okay, so-called ritual is, is being used to control its qing. Okay. So I like to here refer to the uh, here talk about the qing, okay. The, in the doc, doctrine of the mean, right? If we just remind about a few weeks ago, we read the doctrine of the mean. Talk about to have no emotion of pleasure, anger, sorrow, and the joy wearing up is the state of mean. So the mean in the Confucius teaching means your emotion. He doesn't say you should not have emotion. You have emotion but don't the emotion wearing up, okay? And to have this emotion wearing up, but in due proportion is the state of harmony. So the mean and the harmony is the way you try to achieve. So for example, the, the Confucius teaching is when you are angry, you don't be coward then, you know, just pretend you are not angry, but you don't be too angry to fight back, but you have to do it in according to doctrine of the mean. You just control it. Then it show up, but stop there. In, okay. So I think that's the Confucius try to talk about the mean and the harmony, which is called he. Okay. So that's Confucius talking about this. And then of course we will keep talking about the human nature, it's good or bad. Okay. So I just make a quick uh, note reference to the Mencius talking about. Uh, Mencius talking about human nature is good. Uh, that's his writing, okay. Human nature being good is like water tending downward. There is no human who does not tend toward goodness. There is no water that does not tend downward. Now, by striking water and making it deep out, you can cause it go past your forehead. If you guide it by damming it, you can cause it to remain on the mountain top. But is this the nature of water? It is the way because of the circumstances, which is called si, okay? It is also the reason that human can be bad. So Mencius even argue human nature is good, but he's not that naive to say all people are good. Uh, where's the bad people? Because of the circumstances, the si, okay, which make the people bad. You are not in the right environment. Your good nature cannot develop. That's why you become a bad people. That's a Mencius argument. And uh, another person, Xunzi, another Confucius teacher, he argued just the opposite. Talk about human nature is bad, okay? People's nature is bad. That's his, his, his statement, very straightforward. Their goodness is a matter of deliberate, deliberate effort. He used the Chinese word wei, or you can call it artificial, or we call it a fake, okay? So the, the, he, his argument, you know, he talk about human nature is bad, but the good people, because they fake it, they, they use deliberate effort to look good. So, so he was going to talk about like, uh, uh, the people's nature is such that they are born with a fondness of, for profit. If they follow along with this, 
then struggle and the contention will arise and the yielding and the deference will perish therein. They are born, they are born with the feeling of hate and dislike. If they follow along with this, they could, then cruelty and the vanity will arise and the loyalty and the trustworthiness will perish thereby. They are, they are born with desire of eye and ears, a fondness of the beautiful sight and sight. If they follow, so the important thing here, he is talking about if people follow along with their inborn nature and the disposition, which is Qing, they are sure to come to struggle and the contention turn to disruption, social division, and disorder, and end up in violence. So in Xunzi's point of time, you should not let go your human nature. You have to control it. And Xunzi go further to refute Mencius argument. He said, Mencius said, that's in Xunzi's writing. He said, Mencius said, human nature is good. But I said, Xunzi said, this is not so. From the ancient time till now, what people call good is being correct, ordered, peaceful, and controlled. What they call bad is being deviant, dangerous, unruly, chaotic. This is the distinction between good and the bad. Okay. So basically, he talk about good and bad is not human nature. It's the social distinction of good and bad. That's why, you know, there's a perennial argument between human nature is good or human nature is bad. And the Dong Zhong Su's argument is here. He also tried to answer, uh, uh, ask the same question as Mencius question, right? Since the nature of man contains the beginning of goodness and the mind heart contains the basic stuff of goodness, how can it be that the nature itself is not good? Okay, so that's the Dong Zhong Su's answer. For the, he used the example, for the silk cocoon contains silk fiber and yet is not itself silk. And the egg contains the chicken, yet is not itself a chicken. Mencius evaluates the human nature in comparison with behavior of beast. And therefore says human nature is itself already good. I evaluate it in comparison with the sages and therefore say that human nature is not yet good. So that's Dong Zhong Su's argument about the human, human nature. So his point, make it simple, is human nature is not yet good, okay? So uh, how do you make it good? You need the civilization and the culture. In another way, you need the government to do it. So that's Dong Zhong Su's uh, argument. And uh, you can see the flavor here. I just make a quick comparison. Okay, so talk about Mencius, talk about human nature is good. So what's his solution? Put in a good environment and the so-called find your lost heart. You just have a nature developer in a good environment. So you become a good person. That's Mencius argument. Xunzi's argument is different. He seems to say human nature is bad. So the good people, because they fake it, they deliberate. Uh, uh, work on that. So what you need to do, education, training. So he used the example, uh, the wood is crooked and you have to bend it, you should burn it, you should hammer it, make it straight. So you have to go through the hard work, uh, which is education to make you become a good person. Okay. Han Feizi okay, the, is a student of Xunzi, famous uh, legalism. He continued from Xunzi believe human nature is bad, but no, not much different than the animal. So what you need to do is reward and the punishment. So what government to do is reward and the punishment. So the society will become good. That's Han Fei's argument. And the Dong Zhong Su here, his argument is human nature is not yet good. So what the government need to do is civilization and the culture. So you put the a school of Confucius uh, teaching and start to train the people. And so you can see he has a further development, use the power of the government to make people good and they use these people to become the government, do the civil service. 
So just move forward a uh, thousand years later. Okay, Zhu Xi, the famous uh, Neo Confucian scholar, he believed, he truly believed human nature is good. In today's, uh, most of people uh, will say, many just say human nature is good, and basic is from Zhu Xi's interpretation. So he take one step more. He said, everybody have the sagehood in your mind, so you can become a sage. Okay, so that's Zhu Xi's argument. But again, during this period of time, uh, the 12th century, uh, not only Zhu Xi, Lu Jiu Yuan, they have a lot of, and later on in the Ming Dynasty, they have a different argument, but all based on the human nature is good and that you can be a sage. And how? They have a different opinion on that. But today we focus on Dong Zhong Su's argument here. And then if you may feel like, um, why talk, people talk about this? This kind of argument seems not exist in the Western world. But I will argue that in the Western world, people are probably more concerned on the free world. In another way, you know, in Chinese philosophy, uh, I don't see people discuss about free, free will. I'm more talking about human nature. I think so that's have a, a different concept, you know, between Western and the Chinese. So that's one finish one period before I go in forward and they, I'll open up some question of discussion on that. Otherwise we may continue. Okay. okay. Oh, we have a Daniel and the Kevin and the Hugh. Okay. Daniel, please. I think uh, the issue of human nature is uh, fundamental to almost any religion. So I don't think it's just uh, unique to Chinese philosophy. So for example, you know, original sin is uh, the concept of human nature is whatever you want to call it. Okay. <laughs> That's uh, one example. And I know, uh, let's say in Judaism, Maimonides uh, talks about if somebody does wrong, you, uh, you punish him until his good nature comes out. So because fundamental, everybody, everybody's nature is good. And there's other scholars who argue otherwise. So that's a, an incredible, important concept, I think, in almost every religion or Western philosophy as well. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Kevin, please. Yes, can you bring to the nice chart your previous one? This one? Yeah, okay. <laughs> that's kind of like all oh, wow about. First of all, first of all, is for me is uh, what's about nature itself. That's we clear. We got adjective consider human nature. How about non-human nature? What's a good or bad? For me, what I'm saying this is because what's the definition about good? That's important. Then the next question would be how to be that good for, the, for, the, for that standard. I agree with him about the first part. It's, 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 human nature is not good or bad. However, the method itself that we practice it on, uh, on your solution column, we pra practice them all by education, training, or zero the punishment. And modernly, this modern days, we slowly move to a civilization, how about culture? You see the how about culture bias? And can it be sage? What's the sage definition? So different religion, different culture, we have a different meaning about it. Thank yeah, you. thank you, Kevin. Uh, Hugh, please. Yes, I think that it seems to me from the presentation here and the philosophies and the cultures that there is a notion that there is some kind of influence outside of the human nature. So human nature is as a result of some kind of cosmic force. Like, you know, we're looking to another source. Like even in the case of you know, the emperor is the son of heaven. So it, we're, 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 we're denoting that the emperor is related to something outside of the human 
uh, nature or human being. And as a result of that, that's why we have this constant uh, debate on whether human nature is good by itself or whether it's coming from an outside force. And, uh, you know, for, for Tien, which is the Chinese term for heaven, you know, in the Western civilization or Western thought, we tend to use the word God or we're trying to look at the outside source as related to us in some way. So we use human form or human terms to denote this outside force. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. Uh, Metherin, please. All right, well, this is a little bit free associating uh, along, somewhat along the lines of what Daniel and uh, Hugh were talking about. So in the West, uh, we basically, let's say for human nature, we have Hobbes, mm -hmm. the war of all against all, and Rousseau, who is human beings are good, but civilization ruined us. Um, not to mention this is a civilization we ourselves constructed. Uh, I think that human nature in the West is generally covered by religion. And uh, so it doesn't really get debated so much in philosophy. It's kind of relegated to Christianity uh, and various forms thereof. Uh, I'm gonna leave out Judaism and Islam uh, for the moment. And within Christianity, there's a sort of, um, more of a dictatorial God. In other words, it's quite different from Tian, which is eternal, but unchanging and is more of an impersonal force. Whereas it seems as if the, the God of Christianity is more of a pointing finger that is concerned with every soul and every action. Uh, so that there the question of free will becomes very pressing. Um, you know, can we get relief from this pointing finger up in the sky Whereas with Tian, uh, it's much more free form and we're left to work things out on our own and decide on our own. And according to Dong Zhang Shu, um, we will find out the results of those decisions if they're natural disasters or not. Uh, so on a much larger scale, kind of the equivalent of, uh, you know, bringing your umbrella and it doesn't rain or something, uh, but on a moral level instead of a practical one. So I think that the, the differences uh, here are in religion and that's what gives rise to the concern with free will versus a concern over um, human nature. Thank you, Mather. Yeah. Uh, well, Chris. Yeah, I, I agree that, um... I think religion in the West um, covers covers these topics, and and in in China, it seems like it's uh, philosophy that that um, takes it on. And I, I was just thinking um, that that um, um, he seems to uh, maybe offer a synthesis of those two two views. Um, um, I don't know if that's like a Hegelian. And uh, thesis, antithesis, synthesis kind of thing, but um, um, but I think every every um sort of moral path need needs kind of some framework uh um for uh bad exists and good exists and how do we move toward good and and um there's uh there's all kinds of different ones out there. There's um, Mencius is one. There's um, um, uh, the the opposite one. And in, in Buddhism, there's uh, uh, Mahayana has a certain one that's kind of based on more it's good. And and I think uh, the Theravadan tradition is more that it's starting off kind of um, focusing on the the, the bad. And and uh, um, Christianity has original sin, but you need some framework. Um, in, or, in order to um, move toward the good, I guess. Um, so there's so many varieties. 
Yeah, thank you, Will. Yeah, I, that's, I said, I think that's a perennial uh, question. So <laughs> we can discuss for a long, long time. Uh, CK, please. I want to say that <clears throat> we could tell from the start, from the very beginning, that the Chinese are, were and still are a very pragmatic people. The reason for all these emphasis on human nature is because the Chinese wants to know the origins of human nature in order to know how to govern and how to create order and how to create stability. Whereas in the Western sense, there is not, a, I'm not saying completely no emphasis on this, but philosophy is more into questioning the origins of things, like uh, how do, does one know is epistemology, for example, which is not very uh, developed in Chinese philosophy. Um, so I think they're starting from two, two basic different premises. The Chinese wants to philosophy to be pragmatic, mm -hmm. which is why there is this all constant saying xue yi zhi yong, which is uh, not present in, 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 I think, in the Western uh, intellectual tradition. It's more like uh, uh, education for education's sake. Whereas mm -hmm. in, in, in China, it's education to be used to better one's lives and better one's uh, fellow beings. So that is a main divergence between the two civilizations, which I think is important here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, CK. So let me move on. And then uh, we are doing very well at the time. So give me about five minutes. Let me finish them. And then I think this one, if you read that, you will know this one. So justice, OK? Um, I also personally also question myself, like why Chinese philosophy is not talking about justice, okay? So I, I just copy from the, uh, uh, the standard Stanford uh, Encyclopedia of Philosophy, talk about justice, because, and it's in the uh, Aristotle's uh, Nicomachean uh, Ethics, okay? Aristotle saw justice involved the ideal of a proportional treatment, which implies recipients getting an equal amount of whatever good is at issue. If A is twice as deserving or twice as needy as B, justice may require that A receive more than B does. So here, formal equality of treatment, the same rule apply to both, leads to an unequal outcome. Again, when justice takes the conservative form, of respect of existing entitlements or legitimate expectation, there is no reason to anticipate that what is due to different people will be substantively the same. So justice doesn't mean the fairness, basically in the proportional treatment, right? So I do more, I should get more, I should get more respect. That's why you salute to your teacher. Teacher don't salute to the student because, you know, that's the hierarchy, that's the justice disk here. And I think Chinese philosophy skipped this part of definition, just assume this definition and directly go to define what's the relationship, what's the proportional treatment. That's my, my thing. That's why if you read the Chinese philosophy, Chinese philosophers are not talking about justice, but they jump, they assume this kind of justice and go direct to define the relationship. That's why we talk about the five major human relationship and in the doctrine of mean, right? In doctrine of mean, I'm going to, I'm not going to read all this one. In doctrine of mean, talk about the five major human relationship. Talk about the uh, emperor and the minister, father and the son, husband and the wife, young older brother and the younger brothers and among friends. So we talk about about uh, these three, three major human relationship. So it bypass the definition of justice. Just assume the justice is the proportion between the relationship. So they define the five major relationship. And the Dong Zhongshu, because he is taking the Yin Yang school, so he called the three court San Gang in the uh, Feng Yulan's writing, he just he doesn't translate, he just calls three gang, kang, k-a-n-g. But gang, this word means the rope of the net. I just find the 
picture of the original gun writing. So that's the fishnet and the main cord is gun. So that means the three major cord in the net. So the emperor are yang, the minister are in, the father are yang, the sons are in, the husband are yang, the wives are in. So the three court of the Tao, of the true kinship can be found in the heaven. So Dong Zhong Su is talking about yin and the yang, just like uh, emperor control the minister, father control the son, and husband control the wife. That's the three most important uh, social network. So later on, he connects, okay, the five element, okay, Remember the five element, I think so we talk about, I, I'm going to skip this one because usually this one we will, we can take two hours to talk about the five element, the Chinese five element, the fire, earth, metal, water, and the woods, they will uh, produce each other, they control each other. And the Dong Zhong Su go further to define this five element, which is color, with location, with season, with flavor, with different organ, if we go to the Chinese medicine, right? And then in the Dong Zhong Su's idea, even connect with the virtue, five important virtue. The right, righteousness is the metal, the ren, benevolence is the wood, wisdom is water, and the di, richer is fire, and the trustworthiness is the earth. So they put all this one together with the color, with the body, so everything become one system. But of course, we can spend a lot of time to discuss why this one is this, and they come with different theory. So, so let me move on. And the, so I think we talk about this one. Okay, that's final one. Okay, so we talk about the purpose of the heaven, the heaven's purpose, heaven's intention. So this one is also started from the Dong Zhong Su's teaching, right? Dong Zhong Su's idea. Heaven has produced man and the, with nature that contains basic stuff of goodness, but are not able to be good in themselves. Therefore, heaven has established for them the institute of the kin to make them good. This is the purpose of heaven. So he to redefine the purpose of heaven. Okay, the purpose of heaven is give the kin or the emperor the job to make people good. So. They legitimize the emperor's position. Remember, the founder of the Han Dynasty, he is not from the noble background. He is just from the regular people. So how does he, why he can be an emperor? Why everybody have to listen to him? That the, this answer he has to answer, right? Because during that time, just 100 years or 150 years, after the fall of a feudalism, people still thinking about, some people still thinking about the feudalism system, okay? But how come a, 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 a regular people, a common can become the emperor and his son, his grandson become the emperor? Why? Because the purpose of heaven, because heaven will point to the person who has the king and he's going to make the people good and which will make the society good. And that's his purpose. Give the so here is the important thing about the legalism has been included in the Dong Zhong Su's Confucianism government. Let's read what Han Fei's writing in this one. Han Fei's that's the first part is Han Fei's writing, the legalism writing. Without the encouragement from celebration and the reward, without the treatment, okay. Uh, without the threat way, okay, from execution and the punishment, the powerful position the si, would be lost and the, the law, the fa, okay, would be compromised. In this situation, the sage king like Yao and the Sun has to preach door by door. They even cannot govern three houses. So in the Chinese tradition, Yao and the Sun is the sage king. Okay, he doing according to the legend. During their reign, China is in the wonderful time. Okay, he ran very well. That's the role model for all the kids over 2000 years. Han Fei's argument is without reward and the punishment, even like the sage king Yao and the Sun, he has to preach 
door by door. Okay. And then he only can even cannot govern three houses. How can he govern the entire China? He must use it reward and the punishment. That's a Han Fei's writing, legal is writing. And the Dong Zhong Su, even we consider him as the Confucianism, Confucianist. He also writes as such. Celebration, reward, execution, punishment. Okay, remember this four word, celebration, reward, execution, and the punishment. They copy, he copied from the legalism right here. Okay, match, spring, summer, autumn, and winter, respectively. Okay, therefore, I say, I mean, Zhong Zhong Su, the king is co equal with heaven, meaning that heaven has the four seasons, while the king has four ways of government. Such are what heaven and the man share in common. So here is how Dong Zhong Su combined the legal thinking, the government in the Confucian uh, government. And he used the uh, naturalism, okay? The naturalism as a background, as a metaphysical background. So during the history, all the punishment, the uh, execution always happened in Autumn, okay, according to this, spring, summer, reward, that's time for reward. Autumn is time for execution. So if you commit the crime in the summertime, too bad, in two, three months, it got executed, okay. But you commit the crime in the winter time, okay, and then you can wait to the next year, okay, next autumn to execute. That's been practiced over 2000 years. So that's Dong Zhong Su's invention. He, you can see, I think this one is very important because Every, a lot of people argue, uh, even for 2000 years, even Chinese government call themselves as Confucianism, okay? But actually the legalism practice has been buried inside the Confucianism teaching. And how does it bury inside? It used the naturalism as the background uh, to legitimize, to rationalize the, uh, the, the, the government. So I think that's, finish exactly two hours. So then I open the question for, uh, for a while. And then uh, thank you everyone. And today is a pack of information and then uh, a lot of people still stay awake. Uh, that's great, yeah. So we have the uh, Madeline and the Will, please. I believe Will was first. Okay, Will, please. Um, I don't know much about uh, yin and yang and um, is, is, um, are they both considered um, important and good is one, um, it says um, heaven, uh, I think likes Yang more or, or um, something like that. Um, and then I was surprised that um, the wife was uh, Yin, um, um, which is associated, it said, with chastisement and yang with um, beneficence that I would have thought it to be the other way around. But um, maybe, um, what do you know about how, how that gets applied and, and why, why it was applied that way in, in that um, circumstance? Well, I think that's a, we can make it simple, we can make it very complicated, okay? So yin and the yang are relative. Right, so uh, yin and the yang, you can see like yang will control yin, okay? So the husband will control wife, okay? but it probably not happen in the today's society. So, uh, but that's the Chinese teaching, okay? And the, uh, the, 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 the emperor will control the minister, right? And so emperor is yang and the minister is yin, okay? So father control son, okay? It may not be true in today's situation, but in the Confucian's teaching, it's father is young and the uh, son is yin. That, that I just make it simple this way, but we can go more complicated. <laughs> so did I answer your question well? Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess. Um... Okay, that's great because uh, uh, yin and the yang, actually we can talk a lot, but. You know, <laughs> Thank uh, you. Okay, uh, Madeline, uh, Hume, and the CK. Madeline, please. Well, I thought uh, I thought that it was quite interesting the three Kong and the net 
it reminded me of uh, chapter 73 in the Tao Te Ching, uh, which ends with something along the lines of heaven's net casts wide, though its meshes are coarse, nothing slips through. And so for those who haven't been going to Chinese philosophy meetups, I will attempt a brief explanation, uh, which is to imagine that you're outside in a world with no electricity. You're in a rural area and you're looking up at the night sky night after night. And you see that the constellations keep their forms, but they wheel past over the course of the year. So there's a huge cosmic order going on overhead. And that might be uh, seen as Tian or the order giving principle of Yang. And um, as far as the net goes, it might be seen, you could look at the constellations as a sort of net with very large spaces in between them. Um, and yet at the same time, when you think of a net uh, with this, with this chapter in the Tao, I always think of a lobster trap uh, where the opening is so wide that the lobster is like, oh yeah, I can fit in here, no problem. But then it gets in there and it's trapped. So I think that the net of heaven is coarse, but um, catches everyone in the end is that the cosmic order uh, eventually um, contains everything and everyone. And that uh, it's the equivalent of the Western saying about, uh, you know, the mill wheels grind exceedingly slowly, but very fine. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. And as far as yin and yang go, uh, I believe that you could think of it as a mountain. And yang is the sunny side of the mountain and yin is the shady side or the valley. And so yang gets associated with um, male brightness, order, daylight. Yang gets associated with um, things flowing downhill, like water, um, shadow, darkness, and femininity, as well as fertility, because there's water in a valley. Yeah, thank you, Madam. Yeah, in Chinese tradition, when we call the yang part of mountain, that means the southern part of mountain, because China is in the North Hemisphere, right? The sun on the south. So the south part of mountain, you've got the sunshine. So that's the yang part of mountain. And the north side of mountain, that's the yin part of the mountain. So let's go all over the place, but you know, just make it simple. Uh, uh, Hugh and the CK, Hugh, please. Yes, it's, it's very interesting that um, we, we see in the, in, in, in the Chinese uh, historical cultures how, um, you know, it's all a debate on how we view uh, the hierarchy in our society and how we can uh, bring about, you know, goodness, I guess, in human nature. And it seems that there is an element of respect for your superior right and um, out of that respect you will conform your behavior in a way that will be suited to uh, uh, society in a good way and it reminds me of uh, there's a bible verse in first corinthians uh, 11 3 which says but i want you to realize that the head of every man is christ and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. You see, so it's the same, it's the same idea. It's an idea of placing in our hearts that sense of, I guess, reverence, and in some cases, uh, fear of the, the ultimate ruler, which is... I guess in, the, in, in in Chinese philosophy and how I'm interpreting it would be Tian because Tian is heaven and then the emperor is the son of heaven and then the the ministers are the subjected to the emperor and then the women are subjected to the <laughs> to the men right so 
but as you say, not in today's society, I think. Is it possible that we have now through, you know, our historical journey, and we've come to the 21st century, that we are now realizing that it doesn't work that way in every situation because, you know, the question is good things happen to bad people and bad things happen to good people. So how do you, how do you reconcile, you know, the whole thing? That, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, thank you, Hugh. Uh, CK, you still have a point to make? Yes, I, I, I understand and I saw that your chart on the philosopher stopped at Zhu Xi mm -hmm. and his uh, definition is good, that human nature is good, right? But what about the rest of the Confucian scholars or other scholars like uh, in important school by Lu Jiuyuan and uh, Wang Yangmin, mm -hmm. right? There's the, 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 the school of subjectivism or the Xin Xue. I think that, that their idea of human nature is important as well and should be on your list. Um, yeah, I didn't dip to all the list because yeah. I want to put the people. And uh, since you have mentioned this one, and I believe, okay, they all believe human nature are good, but in yeah. a different way, right? So uh, uh, Zhu Xi will talk about human nature is good. And if, what they all agree, you have the sagehood in your mind. And the Zhu Xi will believe, okay, uh, uh, you need to work hard you have to gray your hair and exhaust all the ancient book, okay? And they can you reach it, right? And then Lu Jiu Yuan, the another way, or then later on become Wang Yamin, a Xin Xue. He talk about different way. No, go back to my heart, okay? I will understand as long as I reach the Tao, okay? And got enlightened, put this way. I think he got a very strong influence by two Buddhism teaching. So after that, and I go back to look at all the ancient texts, that's just the commentary of my behavior. So that's my understanding of the, these two schools after you know, that time. But we will have more time to discuss this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, anything else we can talk about? And then I think we finish in the right time. And then, and as I promised, I don't want to go over time too much. And thank you everyone. I hope today's session is good. It's not too dry. And then um, that's where we are going. And next week we are going to the uh, Hinduism. And then- yeah, just, just, just one little question there, Jason. So you, you will post the, the charts uh, by Tuesday, you said. Is that how it works? Is it? Yeah, so, usually okay. I post. I post it. Let me share the post uh, here and then. So, uh, so that's next week. Uh, I will put in the chat. That's the next week. So that's next week and yeah. you can do it. And yeah. then uh, if you want to the uh, uh, thing, then that's the, uh, so I, usually I will post the uh, schedule. Yeah, on that. but the, the charts that you use to do the lecture today, you also post those. Oh, yeah. you talk about the, the, the PowerPoint the presentation? Yeah, oh yeah, 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 the PowerPoint. Yeah, yeah, so just like- uh, uh, It's in that Excel doc, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay, good, Excel good. Doc, in the yeah, Excel yeah, yeah. doc, and okay. then you can go there, and then you have, I, I write the PPT as a PowerPoint. Okay, okay, okay. You can okay. Really see it, and right. then on this side, that's a YouTube, and I also preserve the data page. So okay. Great. Yeah, I yeah that's great. Play. Thank, thank you very much. That's very efficient, actually. I like that. Yeah. So uh, there's no hands up. So then we will finish uh, today. And uh, for those who are mother and happy oh. mother to speak for tomorrow. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. One more question, Jason. So where are you uh, living? Where are you uh, coming from? I'm in Los Angeles. And oh, originally... you're in Los Angeles. Okay. 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 Yeah. All right. Great, yeah, great. and uh, originally I come from Taiwan. And yes, yes, I've yes. I've been here yes. for a long time. And then uh, since the pandemic, I'm doing the meetup. So. Yes, yes, wonderful. That, that's great, great, yeah. wonderful. I appreciate you doing this, Jason. It, it's been an inspiration for me, actually. Thanks, Jason. That was great. All right, yeah, thank you, everyone. Good. And uh, then thank I will you. see you next week. 
All right, Jason. Have Thanks, a good Jason. One. All right. Thank you, right, Madeline, to be co-host even today. Everybody. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we have the big actor. So but, you know, today, everybody. Will have well. so, thank you, everyone. All right, Jason. Have a good one. I was all ready to be the bad young, but no one needed it. Yeah, <laughs> because you are here, so you know nobody behaves. <laughs> So we have to is, is the young today. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. All right. All right. See you guys.